you know, the opportunity, obviously, you know, the fast bowling discussion was a very big one in the lead up to this test. Um, obviously, there'll be differing views through that process, but uh, the opportunity to, you know, uh, give the selectors a, a little bit of a wrap regarding that, they, they held firm. And um, I think uh, many of you would say that there's been some benefit to that process. So I think, um, you know, I, I think on reflection, it's been a reasonably positive uh, couple of days. Obviously, um, we've all seen for the, the Sri Lankans, obviously, um, injuries are a, uh, a difficult part of the world game at the moment. And um, let's not overstate that. You know, they had some difficulty yesterday and uh, with injuries, as we've also experienced in this, um, in this you know, this summer. So um, it's a part of, part of the game at the moment that we've all got to try and be the, uh, very good at. And uh, we're trying to be the best at it. Um, and we've got a long way to go. But um, it's one of those things that if we, we try and play with 11 players, it uh, makes a significant difference to uh, the outcomes of the games. So um, it was an opportunity, firstly, to, to um, publicly sort of support the selectors and say, that's been tough. It's been a tough couple of, uh, couple of days and weeks, and they deserve uh, a little bit of praise at that stage. But secondly, obviously, um, to deal with something that um, has brought a lot of conversation uh, and obviously have a little bit of reflection on it. Not just in a one game presence, but obviously we've, we've had five tests of it now. Um, and I've, I've set up and I've, I've openly said that we've made uh, some mistakes as well during the summer. But at the same stage, there have been some positives as well. And uh, I want to reflect on those as well. Can I ask you about Shane Watson, mate? Um, of last you night, can. He, he sort of said for the first time that he, he may consider giving up bowling or at least, um, at least yeah, ponder it. What's your take on that? And do you think that'd be a good idea for him to prolong his, his international career? So obviously, uh, at the end of the summer um, uh, or the end of the test series, uh, Shane will have the opportunity to sit down with, with a few of us and, and have that discussion. Um, you know, the selectors have been very keen on having uh, people that are multi-skilled across the board. You've seen many of our players bowl this summer, <laughs> even the wicketkeeper. Um, so, uh, look, that will be obviously part of the discussion. But look, um, I think the selectors are open to any discussion with any player regarding how they see that they can get the best out of them. And, and ultimately, we're after performance and we're after people that can perform their skills and their core skills at the best of their ability. And if, if Shane wants to open that dialogue, he's absolutely free to do that and, um, and to be judged on those performances. And I'm sure the selectors will, will, will take that into consideration. Just one more on, on Shane. There was a hell, hell of I a don't lot. believe you one more on Shane. Because well, yeah, <laughs> you know me two more. Um, there was a hell of a lot made of Mitchell Stark being rested, but was there any consideration that Shane might be rested, given he bowled 47 overs in, uh, in Hobart? Yeah, there, there, there was some consideration of it. But look, it, it was looked at as of a collective. Um, obviously, he's, he's multi-skilled. Uh, and uh, he can bring more than uh, a couple of attributes to the game. So, um, you know, when we talk about players uh, missing a game it's, it's, or, or managing their workload or whatever terminology you want to use, um, you know, a lot of this is around young fast bowlers and uh, looking after those uh, young fast bowlers is a pretty, pretty interesting uh, or pretty core principle of what we're trying to do. Can I just hold it there because you've got... Rattling keys? Yeah. <laughs> it's embargo till 2015 or something. You ready to go? Sorry, man. Uh, just, just going on with uh, Watto. Um, from reading his quotes last night, I sort of got the impression that he actually had the niggle, or he felt something going in, and, and, it, and it got worse as the game went on. Is that, that, your... that that's pretty accurate. So it was, yeah. it was a niggle. It was nothing more than a niggle, yeah. um, and but you saw it going in like it was before the game. Yeah, but but look, let's be let's be reasonable. There are, you know, if you're a professional sportsman, you have niggles. Yeah. You have going in. He'd seen, you know, uh, you know, physios aren't usually twiddling their thumbs in the lead up to test matches. So, uh, yes, he had a niggle. Uh, so did a lot of guys, but it did get worse during the test match, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so as it got worse, obviously that uh, had the implications on his. Um, his involvement overall, and obviously it, it's finished uh, reasonably short, and that's uh, a good chance for a few blokes to get over a lot of niggles over the next uh, couple of days. So, so, in hindsight, given his history, should should he not have played, or if he's going to be a, a professional cricketer, does he just have to play in those circumstances and see how he goes? Look, yeah, going into the Test match, obviously a lot of guys had niggles going in, and we had to look at that from a whole collective basis, um, and. Look, that was a possibility. It was a possibility. But um, 
we know that he could contribute. It was uh, we know he had a heavy workload in um, uh, in Hobart, but so did Peter Siddle, so did Mitchell Stark, and uh, we knew from the lesson from Adelaide to Perth that taking a collective group of guys all. Uh, with high injury risks were, uh, you, you can't take everybody in together. Um, so um, in the end, we knew that Shane could contribute. He did contribute with both ball early in for a couple of overs, but also with the bat. And it was a pretty positive contribution. So I think um, I applaud the selectors. They made some decisions sort of to deal with those workloads collectively, not on just dealing with one individual. So, and last one on Watto from me. Yeah. Um, what is what is your preference, or or do you have a wider idea of the preference of do do you prefer to what to keep bowling, or would you be quite happy if he just played as a batsman? Oh look, and this is far more a philosophy around the selectors. Absolutely, we have a, a, a selection policy, and and very much they do want that multi skill ability collectively. So that's just not about Shane Watson. That's uh, they love uh, people being able to you know bat bowl field. Um, uh, bring some leadership to the to the uh, to the table, and, and having more than one skill, and it, it is an important part of uh, what those guys do. But um, you know, when the selectors sit down, they they do look at those that that ability, but also um, they look at the mix as well. And if you've got uh, you know, if, if if Shane or anybody wants to be a batsman only, well, somebody else has got to be able to take up the overs. And that is consideration that the selectors uh, think about when they're putting not only together a squad of 13 like yesterday, but also when they're putting together 11. Uh, how can we make sure that Michael and, and Mickey and, and the selectors and the team um, have a, a bowling armoury that can, can work together and not and deal with a, a James Patterson from Adelaide? And, and we got a little bit exposed there, obviously, which had flow-on effects for Perth. And probably had flow-on effects afterwards. So that's something we do consider and need to consider every time that 11 people are picked. And sorry, I'll just ask one more, sorry. Okay. Um, Mickey, Mickey Arthur said on his press conference yesterday that he could no longer get overs out of Clark and Hussey. Now, I understand Clark because he's obviously carrying a hamstring. What's wrong with Hussey that stops him from bowling? Oh, look, I think what he's meaning, and to be clear, uh, I think, <laughs> uh, is, is just relying on lots of overs from Mike Hussey. Um, I think having a couple of overs here and there, um, you know, we saw Bob Quiney had to step up in those first couple of tests this year. Um, so, uh, you know, the reliance on, on, on Mike taking, at 37 years of age, a lot of overs is something that we can't rely on. Being able to do the odd over here and there, we've seen Dave Warner bowl, not only here, but and take wickets, but also on the West Indies earlier um, in the in the calendar year. So that multi-skill is, is being is being pushed. I know uh, Usman Khawaja bowled even uh, in the Chairman's eleven and got a wicket against Sri Lanka. Uh, so that message is getting through from the selectors, and um, you know that those who work hard on their fielding, work hard on their their other attribute. You know, and we've seen bats, we've seen bowlers bat this year. And bat very successfully with a couple of them, you know, pulling up half centuries. And obviously, Mitch Johnson's uh, knock yesterday was um, you know, quite outstanding. So, um, we want that ability to bat deep. We want that ability for batsmen to bowl. And, and Johnny Verity and Mickey Arthur with the selection panel, uh, the rest of the selection panel, do drum that in. Pat, are you working on getting some kind of succession plan in place regarding the captaincy, given sure. that um, Shane Watson's injury? or him getting injured again and sort of exposed to real leadership vacuum, I suppose. There's no one to deputise for Michael. Well, no obvious candidate, anyway. Yeah, sure. No, and look, um, they've got to pick the team first uh, in terms of dealing with the, the team first. And then there are people that have had leadership uh, opportunities throughout the year and we've had uh, um, looks at that during the year. Uh, there have been leadership seminars run in uh, Darwin when we were up there previously in the, in the camp during the year. Um, but at the moment, this this hasn't changed since the last test. Obviously, Michael and Shane were both, uh, you know, there, there were both questions, obviously, little niggles and, um, you know, Michael's hamstrings well, well documented. So uh, we have planning in place. Uh, look, there's no obvious answer at the moment. We have a young team. We, we have a young team in transition, and, and but many people have captained. Many people have had leadership opportunities. David Warner uh, captained uh, the Thunder at different times. You've had Ed Cowan take Australia A away. Um, we've David Warner, I think, captain Champions Eleven the year before. Um, we've had a few people take opportunities like that. Um, 
So look, at the moment, uh, you know, Michael, uh, Michael's the captain, and but we have leadership opportunity. One of those things that uh, many captains say is that uh, it's one of those things that you need to be in the job, learn, take those opportunities, and we'll look for those opportunities as as the year progresses at different times or, or as opportunity presents. So do you think Michael's long-term successor is, is in the team now? I probably don't want to um, speculate on that. Look, we have to plan for that, but there are obviously lots of leadership opportunities um, in Australian cricket. You can uh, lead your state team, you can lead a BBL team, um, you can lead a Chairman's 11 side or a, or a Prime Minister's 11 side. So we do utilise those leadership opportunities at different times, and if you reflect on the last 18 months or so, we have done that with that sort of succession planning in place. So historically you would say yes historically um but uh that that's genuine speculation at the moment michael's only been in the job a year and we'd be hoping to get a lot more out of him so the process has got to go to the board we'd have to uh absolutely uh, we'd have to put that process through the board and we'd also have to show them what we've done in terms of that succession planning for that. So um, we had to put some provisions in place. I can't really speculate unless I've, I've got that green light from the board. So that, that process still exists. Pat, uh, when you took on the job, did you feel, or you're looking at you know, what the Argus Review said, did you feel that there were issues wider in Australian cricket with the, the concept of leadership and guys taking on, um, taking on roles and responsibilities to, to, to lead other players? Uh, look, when I first stepped in, uh, it was raised and it was part of the Argus Review, that leadership opportunity. So there's been plenty of... Uh, Rod Marsh is running a, a mentoring program with ex-players and uh, ex-leaders around. Uh, you've seen that we've had ex-test players within the within the tent at every um, test opportunity. Uh, we had Alan Border up in Brisbane. Um, and But at the same stage, uh, a lot of leadership... You know, I think many of you would argue you know, that there were questions on Michael Clark when he first came into the role. I don't think there's too many questions about Michael Clark now. And the growth in, in him has been extraordinary. So um, I think uh, the next captain, wherever he is and wherever he comes from, um, will uh, you know, we'll probably have to do a little bit of learning on the job. There's, I don't think there's a lot of jobs you can do and a lot of work you can do prior that's going to get you ready for a role like this. Um, so... We will do everything we can. We'll run the leadership courses. We'll take opportunities. Um, you'll get people to lead in uh, tour matches and tour games to do that. But it, ultimately, under the cauldron, um, that's that's the place where you have to learn and uh, you have to grow them. And, and that's every captain, the first time they captain Australia, I'm sure, um, would, would have to, uh, would be a reasonably daunting task. Uh, Pat, in terms of finding extra overs, uh, Glenn Maxwell, could well be the short-term answer and the long-term answer if, if Watto um, does bowl less or stop bowling. What do you think of that? Yeah, look, obviously Glenn is a, a player, um, ex performed extremely well in the UAE in the ODI period. Um, he was uh, selected both for Australia A and the Chairman's Eleven. so I, I applaud once again the selector has been really consistent here and sent a very clear message um, to him, and, and we've been communicating with Greg Shippard at, um, at the Stars regarding um, he's got to be ready for both forms of the game. Um, it's a difficult time. Uh, but he uh, he bowled a significant amount against South Africa in the Australia A game. Um, he bowled a reasonable amount in the Champions League against Sri Lanka. So I, I think um, if he's called upon, his preparation's been is, uh, pretty good, and um, I'm sure that uh, he'd handled himself uh, very, very well. So um, the first bit is he's in the squad. And, and that's a wonderful accolade for him. And then uh, I'll, the selector on duty, the captain and the coach, can, can deal with the 11 in the next couple of days. Pat, just back to the rotation and resting of bowlers quickly. Um, a, a question a lot of people have had is, is during the Ashes, would the same principles apply or would caution be thrown to the wind more or less just because everything's on the line and you want to pay, play your best team in every test? I, I think the overriding principle is that we, you know, we want to be able to have 11 players who are playing. We're a far better chance when there's 11 playing rather than trying to win a test with 10 or 9 or um, that sort of situation, and we've seen that uh, many times. So, um, you know, we will pick the best team that can, uh, we believe that will be able to finish the test um, and perform absolutely optimally 
you know, there are no reserves in uh, in Test cricket. You can't go and pull someone off the sidelines when someone's injured. So, um, no, look, going to the Ashes it will be the the best team. But we also believe this team that just played recently, you know, was the best team that could perform on Boxing Day. And I think Michael talks about that in Perth. You know, this is the best team to play this test. Uh, we're not doing this for jokes or laughs or just to be controversial. We're doing this to put out the best team and we're doing this to win. Um, we're not doing this just about succession planning and we're not doing it um, to uh, you know, try and be controversial. We're absolutely trying to put out the guys who are fresh, hungry, who can turn up on that day and give an absolutely fantastic performance and raise the competition between all those players. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think sometimes that message gets lost. We want to win. And we want to win every game and we want to win every series. Have you got the players on side, though? When Mitchell Stark wasn't happy about being rested and, and previously other bowlers have said, I just want to play every test. Has there been a discussion with the bowlers to say this is the way it is and you've got to get on board? Yeah, look, I, I, think, I think Dean Jones put a blog out the other day. Of course Mitch wanted to play. Um, what's the alternative? He doesn't want to play. Um, of course he wants to play. Uh, that, that's the right sort of behaviour for any player. Uh, we want them to want to play, we want them to want to win. Um, but there's only 11 spots and, uh, you know, and it's a fairly iconic test and I think that was pretty big for Mitch and it was obviously, you know, this is, we had a chance to win the series here. So I absolutely understand his disappointment and he was, he was disappointed, as would have been anybody that was missing out on selection. Um, they just probably wasn't... Uh, is front and centre in the media eye. Um, so look, I, I think he's a, a really integral part. Um, you know, he's a young bowler at 22, and um, Steve Finn, who's in the same category, hasn't done back-to-back -back tests. Uh, Mitchell Stark's you know, um, done two so far, as the opportunity to do three uh, throughout the summer, and look, for me, he'd be the most durable young bowler in the world. And um, at that stage, and I think that's actually a, for the negativity we're getting at the moment, he's, he's been going reasonably well. But we want to make sure he continues to go reasonably well and not over, overplay him and overstress him and, and, and uh, be another statistic. But look, young bowlers get injured. We're trying to look after them the best we can. Pat, uh, tell me just about the potential test players for Australia. Just how concerned are you about them playing 2020 and that they may jeopardise their Australian test career? Probably rephrase it. What do you sort of... So say uh, Glenn Maxwell, he's been playing for the T20 for the Stars. Now that he's a potential, he's in the squad, just uh, how concerned are you that those players such as Osman oh, Khawaja sorry, yeah. are playing T20 when they're about to get a call up for Australia? No, look, um, and this is where I, I, the BBL teams deserve a lot of praise. Um, they all got letters sort of uh, late November um, on a ODI and test squad preparation. Um, can you work with us for red ball practice during that period? You know, Jackson Bird was out here only the other day um, with a red ball practicing in, in the possibility he would be called up. Um, and so uh, the BBL teams deserve a lot of praise that they've been practising both of those. So the test, the, 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 the uh, selection panel put together that group late November. Uh, Troy Cooley out of the COE has been working with those state coaches to make sure appropriate uh, things have been put in place to, to get those guys prepared, knowing where the calendar is. So I think, um, you know, our heads are already six months ahead, nine months ahead, 12 months ahead. So these... Um, these fixture clashes are well and truly known in advance and this is why we've got to, when we get the opportunity to play a Champions 11, Australia A, there are strategic selections uh, very much with the selectors have been able to forecast out a month or two months or three months and this is where, you know, the selectors do have a plan that the players will see the next week sometimes and the selectors on the other hand will probably have a month, two month, three month view. So uh, Glenn and Usman um, they were obviously selected for the Chairman's Eleven. We copped a bit of criticism for them coming out of that. Um, but Greg Shippard, um, well, it was quite overt in saying this is about Test cricket, and I think the selectors have been very consistent in their selection, sending a message both to the state BBL and state and BBL coaches, but also to the player himself that he needs to be looking at all forms and get ready for all forms. Pat, given the, um, the quite different requirements that we're now seeing unfolding for 
bowlers, pace bowlers in particular, as opposed to, to batsmen. How's it evolving from a contract and, and you know match payment point of view? You know how how are they being how are bowlers who are who are um, you know being rested or, or or you know wanting to play and not being dropped for reasons of form. What, how's that going? So look at the the MOU, which uh, uh, which is the agreement between the Players Association and Cricket Australia. Um, uh, really clearly out, lay out resting and injury payments. and So if a player is out due, due to an issue not related to form, um, yeah, there are payment schedules in place and all that sort of thing to deal with that. So it, it, it that hasn't changed materially for years. Um, that has been part of the previous MOU and, and that was, was flown on. So um, so that, that shouldn't be an issue for, for those players. Um, so they're, they're, the MOU, which is a five-year agreement that was signed... Uh, July 1st or whatever, uh, that goes through from last year is, is a fairly well laid out structure and the players, due to historical reasons, should be well and truly across that schedule.